Hi Church, great to be with you today. Today we continue our series called Praying the Psalms, where Tim will be preaching from Psalm 121. So let's now hear today's Bible reading. Hello, the reading today is Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, one of my favourite moments in the Lord of the Rings movies is at the Battle of Helm's Deep. Theoden, King of Rohan, and Aragorn are fighting an overwhelming and hopeless battle. They're surrounded by innumerable foes and their deaths are imminent. But as the dawn light breaks, they lift their eyes to the nearby hilltop and Gandalf the wizard appears over the crest, accompanied by Aema and a cohort of cavalry. Here's the scene. <laughs> Theoden King stands alone. Not alone. Rohirrim! Aelin. Rohirrim! What looked like a hopeless situation is transformed in that moment as rescue comes, streaming down the hillside. And there are many moments like this in literature, where in the depths of despair and hopelessness, help comes. But what about in real life, in the midst of a family or relationship difficulty, when there are problems with friends at school or colleagues at work? when there's personal sickness, mental illness, growing frailty, or some unforeseen tragedy. Where does our help come from then? It seems too much to hope, doesn't it, that a rescuer will come riding down a hillside on a white horse. Are we simply left to our own devices to help ourselves, to be self-reliant, to just do our best to battle on? Well, today we're continuing our series, Praying the Psalms, and our focus today is on praying for help from Psalm 121. Psalm 121 is one of a series of psalms which run from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, which are all titled A Song of Ascents. It's most likely that these psalms were used by pilgrims as they went up or ascended to Jerusalem on their way to one of the yearly festivals. The language and the imagery through these psalms fits very well with the idea of a journey, of an ascent, and then an entry to Jerusalem. We might think of them as a songbook for a conference. You know, sometimes you associate certain songs with a place and teaching that you received at a certain time. These songs were perhaps a way of focusing and centering the pilgrims on God as they headed up to worship him at the festival. Psalm 121 begins with a question. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? Now, the mountains or the hills 
could be a place of danger. Maybe a wary traveller is watching to see if any bandits are coming over the hills to attack them. But more likely, I think, the eyes to the mountains are looking for the source of hope and help. And especially if this is a song which is being used by travellers heading to Jerusalem, the mountains being referred to here are probably the mountains of Jerusalem themselves. Mount Zion, where the temple sits, the dwelling place of God. Look to the mountains, that's where your help comes from. And the next verse gives precisely this answer. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. If we're looking for help in any of the circumstances of life, the one to whom we need to look is the one who made everything, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Now, in Hebrew thinking, to describe God as the maker of heaven and earth is a way of saying he made everything. Right? There's nothing that has not been created by him. He is the all-powerful God who made it all. Who better to look to for help? And yet, so often we don't. Rather than looking to God, the maker, for our help, we can seek help and comfort through the things that he's made. We can look to our own material resources, our money, to buy some help. Maybe that's through seeking comfort in retail therapy, through food or alcohol. Or it could be by purchasing security or some time-saving gadget. We can look to technology to provide us with all wisdom and knowledge and help. We can look to ourselves, to our own competence, our own giftedness, our own abilities to try and search for some way out of the trouble. You know, I can solve this all by myself. We do live in a highly individualistic society where we value our own independence and self-reliance. And so often that is where we go for help. To ourselves as creatures rather than to the creator. Uh, for the past, past 20 years, the co-op funeral care in, U in the UK has been compiling a list of the most popular songs which are played at funerals. You can think of it a bit like the top of the pops, but for funerals. <laughs> well, the number one song overall in the past 20 years is Time to Say Goodbye by Sarah Brightman and Andrea Bocelli. But at number two is My Way by Frank Sinatra. Uh, and each verse ends with the line, I did it my way. And the whole song ends with these lines. But what is a man, what has he got? If not himself, then he is naught. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blows and did it my way. Yes. It was my way. I made my own decisions. I was self-sufficient. I was independent and autonomous. This attitude of self-sufficiency is really made possible in Western society by our material wealth and our technological mastery. We can buy whatever we need with our wealth and we can discover whatever we want to know simply by asking Google. From where will my help come? My help comes from me, from my own competence, my own wealth, my own mastery of the world. Until, of course, it doesn't. If we're honest, we know that all of these things will ultimately fail us. My competence is limited. My wealth is not inexhaustible. My strength diminishes to frailty. Relationships are not always dependable. I can seek help and comfort in the things of this world, in what is made, including myself, but that is vastly inferior compared to the maker, the Lord who made heaven and earth. Why not go to the source himself? In fact, our self-sufficiency is a dangerous rejection of the living God. We need to lift our eyes upwards to the mountains, to the Lord himself, to assert that he is our true helper and to rely on him for that help. In very practical terms, 
What that means is that we need to pray. I need to express my dependence and my need for God. I need to say to him, I need your help. Is that weakness? Well, Frank Sinatra scoffs at the one who kneels and says that if you don't have yourself, then you are naught. But it's only weakness if God isn't real. It's only weakness if God isn't, in fact, the creator of everything. But if he is, then turning to him is is not weakness, but strength. It's wisdom compared to the folly of trying to do it ourselves. So when I'm faced with the worries and the trials of life, uh, when I'm lying awake in my bed at 3 a.m. and I'm trying to solve the problems of the church and the world and myself, what I need to do is to say, Tim, you idiot, stop trying to rely on your own resources and ask for help. Ask for help from the maker of heaven and earth. So what is the big challenge that you're currently facing in life? And where are you going for help? We need to ask for help and God does give us people and resources to help us. He is the maker after all. But he wants us to turn to him as our maker, to ask him for help. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. But how confident can we be that the Lord who made heaven and earth will help us? What's the extent of the help that he gives us? Well, the remainder of this psalm really addresses this question, and it does it by using the same word over and over again. The word is watch or keep. It's the same word in Hebrew. It's repeated six times. It's just translated slightly differently in English. Uh, So in verse 3, he who slumbers, sorry, he who watches over you will not slumber. Verse 4, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Verse 5, the Lord watches over you. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. And verse 8, the Lord will watch over your coming and going. I hope you get the point. The Lord will Watch over you, watch over you, watch over you, watch over you. He will guard and protect you. He will keep you. He will preserve you. That's the kind of help that we need. And these verses spell out the totality of this loving care. Uh, In verses 3 and 4, we're told twice that God can watch over us because he doesn't slumber or sleep. God's never caught napping. He's never off the job and so caught by surprise. Even when we're asleep, God is alert, God is active, God is in control, and so he can watch over us and guard us in these times. Uh, This is one of the beautiful ways that sleep shows us that we are not God. We spend roughly a third of our lives unconscious and unproductive, right? You are useless, vulnerable, and powerless while you're asleep. And yet the world goes on while you're out of it. But that's okay, because you're not God. And God is still active, alert, and powerful. He never slumbers or sleeps. Verses 5 and 6 pick up the idea of the Lord as a shade or protection. Uh, The word can even mean shadow, which stresses the closeness and the presence of God with us. God blocks the harsh sun from striking a person. Now, that's obviously figurative language, but it's a very powerful way of expressing things, particularly if you're in a hot Middle Eastern climate where the harsh sun's rays striking an unprotected traveller would very quickly bring death. But God is described as blocking the harsh effects of the sun uh, and even blocking the moon's beams. Throughout history, um, the the influence of the moon has been seen to have a powerful effect on a person. That's where we get the term uh, lunatic, right? Someone who's been influenced by the moon and made them a bit crazy. 
God is pictured here as shielding or shading the traveler from any dangerous influence. He's close at hand to protect, and that's true through the day and also through the night. And in verses 7 and 8, this constant and all-encompassing protection is brought to a stunning crescendo. The Lord will keep you from all harm. Not just some, but all harm. There's nothing outside of his control. There's nothing that's too big or too powerful for him. He'll watch over your life. The Hebrew word uh, here, when it says uh, he'll watch over your life, is the word nephesh, which can be translated as soul or life. The sense is that it refers to our very self, our very being. It's, it's who we are. Right? God guards and protects us in our very self. It's more than just, you know, God keeps us alive. It goes beyond that. It's talking about the fact that there, there's an essential part of ourself that God is watching over. Even when we die, God keeps and preserves us that will be with God. There's more to life than merely this life. God watches over your soul, who you are in your very essence. We're also told that God watches over our coming and our going. So in all of our travels and journeys, in all of the season of life, uh, God is there as a protector. Hebrew language often uses two contrasting words to express totality. So to say that God watches over our coming and our going also includes all of the journeying in between as well. God is with us. God is our protector throughout. And as the last line asserts, he does it both now and forevermore. There's no end to the protection of God. He protects us in our present circumstances, but whatever the future holds and even into eternity, it's the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, who watches over us. Who is the one that we need to turn to for help? It is the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. There is no constraint, there is no limit, and there's no exception to his help and his care. This psalm is an expression of the totality and the completeness in all that the Lord does for us. Well, that's all well and good, you might say, but isn't that completely unrealistic, right? To say that God guards us from all harm, God won't let our foot slip, isn't that out of touch with the realities of life? What about all the bad stuff that happens in the world? What about the bad stuff that's happened in my life and to my family and to my friends? How can you say that God watches over us at all times and in all circumstances? That's a very good question. This psalm makes no mention of any of that. It's merely focused on the complete protection of God. But that's not to say that the Bible or even the psalms as a whole are naive about or ignorant of suffering. As we've mentioned through this series on a number of occasions, the most common type of psalm is a lament psalm, a psalm which cries out to God in the midst of pain. Um, why is this happening, God? How long will this go on for? And the we most well-known of the psalms, Psalm 23, um, is honest about the realities of suffering and difficulties. It mentions enemies. It talks about walking in the valley of the shadow of death. And yet even in the midst of these difficult circumstances, it reminds us God is present. God is there to protect. God is not asleep on the job. He has not lost control of the situation. We live in a world which is broken. We live in a world where suffering is a reality. Uh, and the Bible is as honest about that as anywhere. That's one of the things I love about the Bible. It's sheer honesty and engagement with the reality of life. But in the midst of those circumstances, whatever they might be, and for some of you that might be right now, in the midst of these circumstances, where will your help come from? It will come from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He is the God of love and comfort and help 
Who can sustain you through this time? I've lost count of the number of times I've had a conversation with someone from this church who's been going through a season of terrible personal challenge and trial, but who has said to me in the midst of that time, I've just been so conscious of God being with me in the midst of it. And I don't know how people who don't know God get through things like this. The Bible doesn't promise us a trouble-free life, but it does assure us of the constancy of God and his protection even in the midst of trouble. This is all the more true for us who now read this psalm as Christian scripture, who read it in the light of the coming of Jesus. Jesus himself went through temptation, rejection, he was misunderstood, and he experienced tremendous suffering, not least in his very death on the cross for us. And yet he did so trusting in his heavenly father to help him and watch over him. And that trust was vindicated in his resurrection. The Lord did keep his life. The Lord did keep him forevermore. And that ultimate hope is ours also. No trial or difficulty will so overwhelm us that it will undermine the help and the care of God. He will triumph and his help and his care will be vindicated. One of my favourite Bible passages from Romans chapter 8 captures this so well. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hardship, distress, and persecution are realities. Famine, violence, and death are realities. But none of it can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, the promise of Psalm 121, that the, that the Lord will watch over us, that the Lord will help us, finds its fulfillment and finds its assurance in Jesus Christ. He's the yes, he's the amen to the hope expressed in this psalm. Amidst the reality of pain, of grief, of trouble, we can trust in the Lord who is the maker of heaven and earth. We can trust in his son, the crucified and risen Lord Jesus. We can lift up our eyes to the mountains and we can know where our help comes from. Do you believe that? Do you believe that in the midst of whatever your present circumstances are? Do you believe that for whatever the future might hold for you. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, we lift our eyes to you, knowing that our help comes from you. Thank you that you watch over us, waking and sleeping, night and day, coming and going, now and forevermore. Help us to trust you, in all these circumstances, confident that nothing can separate us from your love in Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Tim. Now let's respond in worshipping our Maker, our source of hope and help, through singing his praises and spending time with him in prayer.
Hi, my name is Bruce and I'm leading our prayers today. You might like to respond to Lord in your mercy with hear our prayer. And at the end, we will pray the prayer that Jesus taught his followers. So let us pray. Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who watches over us. We come to you, therefore, gracious Lord, with our thanks and our concerns. Merciful God, thank you for our world with its beauty and wonder and diversity. Help us to use its resources generously and wisely. Help us all to live in harmony with your creation and with each other. We see things in our world that concern us. And so we pray for the men, women and children who are trying to live where there is conflict and hunger and poverty. We pray for people who have fled from their homes to find peace and safety. We pray for people who have lost family and houses in floods. We pray for the leaders of nations. Give them wisdom, integrity and compassion. We thank you for all who bring justice and peace to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for our own country. We thank you for all who work to heal, to bring justice, to help others. We pray for the people in our community who are often forgotten and ignored. We pray for people who are without work or without homes, people who are without family or friends. We ask that you would give wisdom and compassion to the men and women who lead our country, our state, our community. Please give strength and encourage all who are working to help. We ask that you would help us to be people of grace and truth and reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for your church and mission. We thank you for the staff and volunteers here at St. John's. We thank you for all who are spreading your message of mercy and forgiveness throughout our world. Please give them the strength they need and encourage them. Please help us all in whatever we do to be your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for the people we know who are in need. We bring to you those who are sick or grieving or lonely or in pain. Give them healing and comfort. Please give gentleness and patience and strength to those who are caring for them. Please help us all to be people of compassion. We pray for the things and the people that are on our own hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Glorious God, Father, Son, Spirit, full of grace and truth, thank you for the life you have given us in Jesus our Lord. Thank you that in his life, death and resurrection you forgave us and brought us back to yourself. Thank you that in him you will put all things right. Thank you that you are with us and you hear our prayer. Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who watches over us. And we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In a world all about doing things my way, 
where we rely on our independence, our competence, our money. Whatever your week looks like for you this week, let's look up to God, our source of hope and help. In Jesus, God is with us. Let's find help in the one who's here with us. Let's find help in the one who never sleeps. Let's find help in the one who sustains us in the midst of trouble. Well, thanks for joining our digital service today. Please head to our website, stjohnsdc.org.au to find out more. Have a wonderful week. Take care.